Uh, last week, we continued with our series, The Christian Identity and the Missionary Movement of the Church. We briefly wrap it up as those missionaries were returning to the headquarters of the Church of Antioch that sent them out. And just as we were watching also the students and faculties and professors returning to the classroom, but these had to return back to headquarters with the report of what they have witnessed through their ministry that God himself has done. Uh, those missionaries have also given God praise for every miraculous sign and wonders that they have experienced throughout their missionary journey. They took no credit to themselves. Uh, they grasped, watch me well, grabbed no glory from Christ, but give it all up to the Lord, even as they testified to the church back home. I remember very well last week, we opening up the sermon by uh, recalling those uh, missionaries without passport, even to do a double and thin drive to our children, going into the school environments themselves, our professors and teachers going to the school environment themselves as also missionaries of our time, but without passport to go into those environments and taking the gospel, taking the word to the world. We use an illustration as we opened up last week, vis-a-vis -vis the eight first minute of an airplane that is flying. The pilot ought to know one of the major law in flying is to know where you're going to land before you take off. And we also spoke about the last eight minutes of landing, just like the first eight minutes are critical. And we also spoke about the last eight minutes is important, as critically important as the first eight minutes. You saw it for yourself on national news yesterday. This 40-year-old man who landed literally on the streets in a, how, uh, a neighborhood in Florida with a very small airplane, he was flying. And as the news media were interviewing him, he was so grateful, he gave the credit to Locke that he survived. And at the same time, he admitted that he was, that was his fault because he failed to check on the level of the gasoline in that airplane. Again, uh, we, we use those as illustration to fly with the sermons even on last week, this morning. If you'll give me the license to keep in mind the same imagery of an airplane, but now we have to use it very swiftly in the sense of telling you both wings, one is grace, the other one is faith, and without those two, listen, salvation will not take off, will not fly. In other words, is critical aspect of the salvific work of Christ is depending upon two things. When we go out in the mission field, in the neighborhood to do evangelism, to present gospel to our friends, family members, we don't tell them to do certain things in order to be saved. No, we look up to those two wings of the same airplane, grace and faith, and we watch those other two things that happen to an unsaved person that grants them the salvific gift that is from God himself. Never from the presenter. Never from the preacher. Never from the pastor or from the priest. It's always from God. Salvation is originated with God himself. The provision for salvation and its work brought to us by Jesus Christ. But the sealing and the keeping of our salvation is being done by the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that. Very important here. God the Father is the source of our salvation. God the Son is the one who brought salvation to us in time and space. And God the Holy Spirit of, is the one who seals the salvific work of Christ in every believer until we see him face to face in glory. As we return now to the text in Acts 15, we have now encountered a different setting altogether. This is not a report as they were giving in the church of Antioch. Now the believers are encountering a challenge before them, and the challenge before them is now Gentiles begin to come by the hundreds. 
Gentiles are coming into the faith by the thousands. The family of God now is getting to be really multi-ethnic, multi-racial, but with the same salvation in Christ Jesus. As I just studied it biblically, we know it to be true, that God is the source of salvation. Jesus brought it to us here through his sacrificial death on the cross, burial, and in resurrection. And every time someone will hear the good news of salvation, and accept Jesus as their Savior, the Holy Spirit of God seals them instantly. Ephesians chapter 1. Here in the chapter 15 of the book of Acts, in most of your Bibles, any records of this writing by Luke, you will find a subtitle entitled, listen to this, The Council at Jerusalem. For the sake of our series, the Christian identity and the movement, listen to me, the missionary movement of the, of, the, of the church with subtitles today's sermon as Grace and Faith Silence the Court. Grace and Faith Silence the Court. Those two wings of the airplane I mentioned. Grace and Faith Silence the Court. Uh, my dear brother, a colleague in the work of the Lord, I'm glad I had a chance to visit with some of the staff members this week and working out some of the details for future internship, working with some of our interns and together with their congregation. Chuck Swindoll has been very well known through his radio ministry, Insight for Living, but he was also a president of Dallas Theological Seminary and author of many Christian books. I had the privilege to sit for a semester under the teaching of Dr. Swindle with a group of about 20, 20 men or so. I don't remember. No, there were no ladies there. It was simply 20 men during our doctoral class. We took this leadership, church leadership class under his tutelage. Uh, one of the encouragement that he will impart to us is the importance of the ecclesiastical body and the leadership of the church, primarily when it comes to the seriousness in the clarity of delivering our God's words, the integrity to the text, the dependence on the Holy Spirit of God, listen, and the watchfulness for heresy that can invent any church at any time. I am indebted to so much. Never, never forget when we were sitting in class, he will come up with a stack of index cards to show us how he take time to literally drill in the text, pour his soul over the text, and then he does it weekly. And in a way that he's been doing it weekly for decades and sometimes dig into the original text. Why am I saying all that? He was one to help me to develop a real sacred fear and reverence for the holy records. So it was with Paul and Barnabas. They were not simply satisfied now. They have cruised through the Roman world with the gospel and they have covered many territories. Humbly, they return back home. When the way back home, you and I have already visited and studied the path that they have traced back in sharing the gospel, in strengthening the church, in establishing elders, but now giving report to the leadership of the church of Antioch. Following that leadership from the church of Antioch, they encounter, healed me, a challenge on an ecclesiastical level that has to do with the evangelism and missionary work of Jesus Christ. At the core of the gospel presentation, some people are coming, primarily Jews, coming with a imposition and an addition to the way that Gentiles can receive Christ. I want you to stay close with me here. When we are talking about grace and faith, silence the court, I was so tempted to adapt from my mentor, Swindle, as I just mentioned here, 
He entitled this portion very often, Grace on Trial. <laughs> but rather than following it identical for the grace on trial, I just see, yeah, both of them are in the text. Grace and faith, if you will, silence the court. The council were shut down, so to say, when grace and faith took the stand to say, no, it's by grace through faith. And I said to myself, no wonder Paul, standing in the court, Standing before the council as one of the missionaries just sent now, not from Antioch to the mission field of Cyprus, to Lystra, to Ica. No, Paul and Barnabas were sent now, hear me well, as missionaries to discuss the issues and the challenges of the church of Antioch from Antioch back to Jerusalem. You need to take notice here. There is some serious debate among evangelical scholars and theologians vis-a-vis -vis this passage on today, Acts 15, when they place that parallel to the talk of Paul in the book of Galatians as if Paul and Barnabas did not go to Jerusalem to receive authenticity of the gospel itself. They already received, the, they've already experienced and thought the authenticity of the gospel to throughout the Roman world, the places that I've mentioned. But this time, the discussion was to shut down men of heresy who wanted to impose their own Jewish law and tradition over the Gentiles as an aside to grace as an aside to faith in order for them to be saved. Stay with me here. The issue was not whether Gentiles can be saved. No, they have evidence that they can be saved already. The issue was not whether Gentiles can receive the Holy Spirit. No, they have evidence that they have received the Holy Spirit. The issue is that they must do what we do as Jews also in order for them to be saved. That's in what we call salvation by works. You have to do something in order to acquire your salvation. We know at the very core of this, it's heresy. Let's look at the text for ourselves. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Look at the text. Some men came down from Judea. By the way, when we're talking about the Judea, it's the region. Embedded in Judea is Jerusalem. Don't miss that, okay? Judea is the region, the county, if you will. The city is Jerusalem. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch. So, from the initial place of Holy Spirit coming down, birthing the church, the apostle, personal, home base with the gospel, where the Holy Spirit came and identified every Christian and birthed the church initially. Judea. Jerusalem. They left Jerusalem, Judea. They went to Antioch and were teaching a false doctrine in the salvific ways. In other words, their salvific message had error in it. What were they teaching? The case is presented, listen to me, twice in this chapter. Don't miss that. The issue of the case that caused Paul and Barnabas to leave Antioch, go to Jerusalem to visit with the council is, mentioned, is presented twice. I don't want you to miss the issues. Verse 1, chapter 15, and verse 5, chapter 15, presented us the case. So you have some issues here. It's coming from outside with some men in the region of Judea. It's also coming from within the ranks of the brothers with the Pharisees who are pushing their points. You need to stay alert. Why am I pressing upon those important points here? Sometimes the heresy can come from people within the ranks of the church. They had an old teaching. They had an old preference. And they begin to slip it in as if now this is as important as you wearing an eagle, as you wearing an earrings, as you wearing makeup, as you do not wearing, do not wear long skirts, as you do not wear pants, as you, all of these things are slipping them in and they are within the body. It can come as policies. It can come as protocols. 
But when you get to the salvific level, what do you mean by salvific? When that reaches the level of presentation of the gospel in order to be saved, you need to pull back. You need to pull back because you're flying over no flying zone here. You're touching non-negotiables here. Look at verse 1 once again. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching to the brothers. What were they teaching? Here it is. First case presented. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. That's what they were teaching. Which is a salvation based work. And that doesn't call it them. It has never caught it since then, and it's not cutting it in our time. You need to be aware. Some of those issues are not just initial issues in the early church. We are still facing them in various forms, shape, and mode. We need the power and the presence and the wisdom and the consistent obedience to the Holy Spirit of God to detect some of those heresy when they are infiltrating the church to pollute the true and pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the same time, we need men and women of courage who are able to stand against heavy pockets, influencers. Listen, we have a new terminology during this war with Ukraine and uh, Russia called Hollygogs. Those are the, the those who control the banks and control the supermarket, the Walmart. And when they begin to invade your church, even with a wrong theology, you need to stop them. And the church of Antioch with the leadership was wise enough to say, we, we, we this is heavy. Even though we have been the best for the missionary movement of the church, we cannot stop this with ourselves. We need to go back to headquarters. We need to go back to consult with the authorities to discuss this matter. And I'm glad to see what the leadership of the Church of Jerusalem did. Look at the text once again. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 2. This brought Paul and Barnabas in sharp dispute and debate with them. Now, stay here with me. Because the end of the chapter 15, you will see Paul and Barnabas in sharp debate and discussion. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about in this early age here in the, of the chapter is that Paul and Barnabas are just returning and exciting from the mission trips. I say mission trips because they've been to several cities. Those guys are doubly charged with evidence of the wonders of God. Evidence of signs and wonders. Crippled people made well. Blind people made, uh, give their sight to them. And then we see many come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Beaten close to death, even believed to be dead and come back to life. And keep on pushing and they're returning now seeing many Gentiles. Accepting the Lord. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Those guys are charged up with strong theology. In practice, they've seen the evidence. And when they reached back to home, back home to Antioch, they were sharper than ever before. They were ready more than ever before to take those false teachers by the throats. So they began to have sharp, Luke says, watch the text. Luke says, sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were at this point, appointed by the leaders. You need to see the ecclesiastical authority that's going on here. Not only spiritual authority, but ecclesiastical. That is to say, the, 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 the authority of the leaders of the church. There come a place where our churches need to come back to what we call ecclesiastical authority, link with the divine authority, assignment, and even apostolic authority that the Lord have assigned to them. This is no joke. This is not like earning another store. This is not like opening up another business. This is not like opening up a school or an academy. No. 
When we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ, there are some serious repercussions, there are some serious responsibilities endowed to the office of the pastors, teachers, prophets, even as we speak in here, ecclesiastical authorities. Paul and Barnabas, the great leaders on the innovation field, the men who are performing wonders and great miracles, the men who have experienced priests, nations, want to come at their feet to offer sacrifices and had to refuse those sacrifices. When they come back now home, they submit themselves to the ecclesiastical authority of the church of Antioch. There were teachers too, not simply when they come back from the mission trip. Even before they left, they were teaching at the church of Antioch. You will tell me that when they come back from the mission field with more ecclesiastical clouds, with missiological uh, evidence all around them, with great joy of watching Gentiles, they, listen to me, by now they are more loaded than the leaders that they left behind when they return. Listen to me. Now they are more popular in the congregation because now people are hearing and seeing evidence of their missionary work right before their eyes. But these things never get into their heads. They submit themselves to the authority of the ecclesiastical body at Antioch. And thus, just like they were appointed as missionaries to go to Cyprus, to go to Lystra, to go to Iconium, to go to uh, to go with the message of the gospel. Watch me work. Now, they are also, the two of them, Paul and Barnabas, appointed by the leadership of the church of Antioch, watch me, to go to the church of Jerusalem. <laughs> if the church of Antioch was solid, the church of Jerusalem is the headquarter, the fountainhead, where things have been held up with the body of faith, with the apostles who are standing there, with James at the helm being the senior pastor of the church of Jerusalem. We're talking about apostolic authority, ecclesiastical authority, biblical truth and faith anchor authority right there. Peter will say it later on in this very text. My very lips. <laughs> I wish I was there to see old Pete. Remember I told you back in Acts chapter 13 and chapter 12. When you read chapter 12, the ministry of Peter is over when it comes to being the apostle to the Jews. This time, he stepped up the plate once again in, with the council. Apostolic authority. This time, Peter now has been stepped up again to speak. Why? Why, Pastor Durst? It is to reconcile this issue, this mixed bag that those false teachers want to bring to hinder the Gentiles from truly accepting. You know what they were doing? They were about to give the Gentiles a counterfeit gospel. If you want to accept Christ, fine. But you must also accept him to do this, that, and the other. That's an insult to the blood of Jesus. That's an insult to the Holy Spirit. It's almost like I tell people, when you hear someone here that you are from Haiti, or you're from Africa, or you're from any, any third world countries, and now you're a minister of the gospel, and they're looking up as if, oh, uh, uh, what, you what? These are the people who receive missionaries. You're telling me they can be Bible teachers too? You're telling me they can be pastors too? You're telling me they can be leaders too? As if the, the spirit that has upon them is like a lesser spirit. Like we have a third world spirit, a second world spirit, and the, uh, and the, and the modern countries. Listen, church, come back to the reality of honoring Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit that he left behind to sustain his church. This is happening infiltrated with all kind of ethnocentrism, all kind of racism, all kind of classism, all kind of things that it's painful to watch this in the church. And we, as the people of the church of Jesus Christ in 2022, we must face these things head on. Why? 
because they might tend to pass on those very erroneous teachings, those very heresy to weak sets, whatever the race, whatever the gender. So many pollution was to come in, culturally, but also religiously. You got to have your eyes wide open. What they were suggesting here is within even the Jews, you cannot be a true Jew, considered to be a true Jew, if you're not circumcised. In fact, the mark of circumcision was so thick among the religious Jews. If anybody has not been circumcised yet, I don't care if your skin was as bleached as you could have it, you're not a true Jew. Because the mark of a true Jew from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob downward, you had to be what? Circumcised. Paul himself is going to deal with this theological issue, racial issue, extra issue. That will pull it the gospel very deeply, even in the book of Romans. Letting you know, you are proud in your skin cut as a circumcised Jew. He dealt with it in Galatians too. But the circumcision, the true one, is the circumcision of the heart. You find those cultural issues. That's why when we're talking about missionary movement, we need to be extremely careful. I should quote now because it is true it was said publicly and he has taught it as well. My dear brother and colleague and teacher from Moody Bible Institute Graduate School, Rick Callenberg. As I'm speaking now, Rick Callenberg this morning today is in the country of Liberia. What is he doing there? He's starting up and rallying and gathering around him teachers and structures to start a seminary, an evangelical biblical seminary in Liberia. But I'll never forget, in 1994, when Rick Columber was coming back as missionaries from Nigeria, spent a long time serving there before he taught at Moody Bible School, uh, graduate school, before he taught at Dallas Theological Seminary. One of the major issues that they have to deal with is when missionaries go to those third world countries or Africa and elsewhere, and then people are coming as if now you don't you cannot wear your cultural clothes. You have to become Americanized now. You have to do your hair in certain way. You have to you have to you have to do. It's a thing that has nothing to do with the gospel and the faith. When these things begin to filter early on in my theological and biblical and missiological training, these true servants have been drilling in my soul the dichotomy between cultural matters and biblical truth. The accuracy of teaching and preaching the word of God in any culture, that this thing is above every culture. You come up by grace. Faith upholds you here. Not your money, not your reputation, not your education, not your network, but faith upholds you at the foot of the cross. This is not just a new issue. The church of Jerusalem had to deal with it. What I'm afraid of is that our churches have been so infiltrated with everything else matter. Black lives matter. White lives matter. But the gospel, you can do whatever you want because God is a forgiving God. He's a, you know, bring whatever you bring. Jesus plus. Bleed Jesus plus high heels. Jesus plus, you name it. Listen, these are serious issues of eternal life, of eternal death, of a solid church or a club of synagogue of Satan. You got people, as I said last Sunday, they want to have the clouds, but they can care less about false doctrines and false teaching. Everybody wants to be politically correct. Nobody wants to hurt nobody. Sleep as you want to sleep, wherever you want to, with whoever you want to, as long as you can get yourself dressed up and make loud noise and show up in the choir, show up on the stage. And, and th who are we? Who? Are we play? What kind of faith are we passing on to the next generation? Paul said, hold on. And the leaders come together. The sad that I wish I was there to see the same two guys making a 180 ter degrees turn to go now, not back to Syria, Cyprus, but now to Jerusalem. Watch the text. Chapter 15, verse 3. They appointed along with them Paul and Barnabas along with some other brothers to help them to go up 
through Jerusalem. Don't miss this. Every time, this is one of the instances. You head in the holy city, it's always going up, going up, going up. You can trace it in the biblical records anywhere. Whenever somebody is toward disobedience, you will watch them from the holy city standpoint, going down, down, down from Jerusalem. Not just a New Testament issue, even with Jonah. Jonah left down from the holy city. He went down to Joppa. He went down by the seashore. He went down underneath the boat. This is not just I suggest this. It's a me, Hendrix, come on, Howard Hendrix, observation of the text. But that staying consistent with the biblical teaching and accuracy of expositing the word of God. They went up to the holy city. There's another nuance here. It's almost like when you're going up to the holy city, you're also going up to Zion, but not just the geographical location. You're looking up to the God of heaven and earth. You know, when the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? <laughs> Paul and Barnabas are heading up to the holy city to find true help, to find false teachers. False teachers who are very stern with their heresy. They're going up to Jerusalem doing what? Con consulting with spiritual, ecclesiastical authorities. So, when they got there, this is where faith and grace will silence the court. Chuck Swindoll will put it, faith is on trial. Hallelujah. But by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, faith and grace will always win. What does that mean, Pastor Doris? We win. <laughs> Those who remain true to the faith we win. The end of the book says, no matter how much tribulation, opposition, and persecution that you're going through, at the end, we win. Those who remain faithful and endure the pain. Those who do not compromise for the temporary bling blings, we win. Look at the text for yourself. It says this. When they got to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders, they did not go for buildings. They did not go over there to look at, listen to me, palaces. They were looking for true, authentic, responsible elders and leaders. Let me say this again. They went to look for responsible elders and leaders. I wonder if Paul's theology I don't need to wonder. Paul theology is going to be taking some serious bones and shapes, even listening to those elders and leaders. Because even, watch me, this is not a mission trip to the heathens. Hallelujah. This is another different type of mission trip to the headquarters of the, not humanly speaking, but spiritually speaking, the power that be on a human level to guard the faith. Who are those? James, Peter. We're talking about men of the inner circle entrusted by the Holy Spirit to deliver, expound on the day of Pentecost. These are the men that Paul and Barnabas will face. I, I wonder just by sitting in their presence, watching all Peter coming in now on his uh, uh, walker, trying to step up to take his seat among the council, and, and watching James humbly standing there to remember, I spent years with my brother. I did not even pick up on a faith until after he came out of the grave. But now the responsibility of overseeing, not just the mother church in Jerusalem, but now we have a hub in Antioch that's growing. We're hearing what happened in Cyprus. We hear what happened in Iconium. The responsibility is getting heavier and heavier. But wise men who walk with wise men become wiser still. That's the book of the Bible, the proverb. You walk with the wise, you get to be wiser still. You walk with men who are filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't go after Ouija board to find your decision making process. No, you follow their process, the word of God, prayer and fasting. <laughs> 
it has not changed even for 2022. Lately, the words has been marketing. Lately, the words have been branding. Lately, the words have been icons. There is nothing wrong with these things. We have to modernize, make ourselves relevant, but we don't let these things take the precedence of spiritual authorities, spiritual legacies, spiritual listen, ecclesiastical authorities are covering. It's like lately we can do whatever we want to do because we give, we are the biggest givers, the largest tithers, and this and that. And therefore, we can press a button there and cause everybody to dance in the council. Not here. Not here. Your money will not cause it here. In fact, Paul, just sitting, listening to the council decisions, he has already encountered on the mission field sorcerers who are to come and bribe them with money so he can just think they can buy the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Here is Paul now, shaping up theology on the feet of the council to take back to Antioch, not just to the church of Antioch, to all the churches of Jesus Christ. No wonder this man is going to write 13 letters in the New Testament. His theology was straight. His ecclesiology was straight. His missiology was straight all the way through where are where are these servants in our time when the decay is getting so thick and we need men and women with courage and the power of the Holy Spirit of God who will stand against whoever wants to come in to pollute the faith I want to submit to you. We have many among us still. I thank God for David Jeremiah. I thank God for Joseph Stowe. I thank God for Tony Evans. Chuck Swindoll, I thank God. I can go on down. We still have monkey sick around the block. We got Mike Simmons up the streets. We got men who are coming and still sweating and holding on to the faith, no matter. And, and men who's not doing it for the money, but defending the faith of our fathers, the faith of our Lord, the biblical truth, the essence of our gospel. Where is Cornelius? Look at the text with me. So they went up. As Paul is shaping his theology, listening to the, watching how will those guys make the decision with those mothers. Chuck Swindoll, come and talk to me. Chuck says this. These guys were men who were devoted to hammering out of the emotional charge theological deliberation. Hallelujah. Come on, Swindoll. Say that again. <laughs> Those are men leaders who are devoted as the set to wrestle with the issues. They are devoted to hammering out of this emotionally charged theological deliberation. The court will be silenced by grace and faith. Hear me well, church. There must be a time that we stand for what is truth and what is right and what is faithful. God will reward the servants who do so. You don't fly for by every wings of doctrine, every flip-flop lips who can flip-flop and then go along with them. Uh-uh. You test the spirits. You put it up against the word of God. You swallow it if it's true. And if it's not, you blow it out. And you don't even associate yourself. Those are dangerous viruses that are destroying souls. Many of our young people are out of churches by the time they reach college. You know why? They've been drinking too much Kool-Aid from some of those jokers behind some pulpit. Playing games with their minds from infancy. That's what I will encourage the serious one. Teach them the word of God. Encourage them to read the scriptures. Tell them it's not weird to pray. Put God first in your life. It's not just a statement to put out there as to show people you know who God is. No. You will literally put God. Your, your feet hit the carpet. You commit your soul to the Lord. 
for the whole day. You coming back home, whenever you coming, you stop to thank God. You spend time in taking in the word. This young girl just turned 14 this week. When I step into the place of the celebration of her birthday, and of all the things I heard, my heart leaps when I heard she reads her Bible consistently, daily. I said, no wonder she's doing well in school, in top of her class. People can make fun of her. They can call her elephant brain. They can call her all kind of weirdos. I said, honey, you be a weird. I remember you were not even seven years old. I walked into your parents' home. I saw you laying on the couch with a Bible in your face. You're taking the word early. Those are weapons that will keep polluters away from you. You will know how to crino. You know what that is? Crino is the ability to judge, make right decisions. We need to train our kids to be in the word so that even if Billy Graham will come out of the grave to give them to a monkey, they will say, Billy, you probably go into some doubt moment like John the Baptist who was in the prison. No, 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 no. This is what the word of God says. Oh, when Paul himself will come out. Say, Paul, did you not say even if an angel was disguised as an angel of light but preaching a different gospel, a mixing gospel, that angel itself is curse but you know what we're propagating lately hey if you do this you curse you are a witch doctor you cursing everybody you telling them to stay in a straight jacket you don't want them to go out and hang out no the word says that there's an enemy who's out to steal and destroy their soul chuck surrender come on chuck speak to me go after those jokers who are already part of his club he got them already. He's after the kids who have a destiny so he can abort their future. I'm not going to let you go unsupervised. I'm not going to, if I'm dead, I'm dead. But I'm not going to release you to the mouth of the sharks and the, and the lions out there ready to make you into a homeless. Why would I do this? And I'm still having the word here. Am I making, um, have I become a street performer? Or have I been given divine responsibility to death do you part? Which one do I respect and honor? Huh? The church of Jesus Christ, his word, his principle. Someone said to me this week, just practice the principles. That's all. That's all you need. Practice the principles. Why? Principles do not change with times. In fact, principles know how to contextualize itself every time, everywhere it goes, so you can continue to stand as principles. So if you practice the principles, you're among the whites, you, you know, you're a kingdom kid, you're among the black, you're, kingdom. you're among the black and white, you're kingdom. It's not ethnicity or environment. You're among the poor, you're a kingdom child. You're among the rich, you're kingdom. Their limousine do not impress you. Their worst worry will not cause you to compromise. You are kingdom. You practice the principles. PP, practice the principle. The biblical principles that I'm talking about here. And we need men and women, parents with backbones, to stand to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Not just in the family circle, in the ecclesiastical circle. As for me and my church, we're going to serve the Lord. You got your trash? I'm not going to mix you up here with the choir. Oh, you got your trash? I'm not going to mix you up here with the deacons. You got your trash? I'm not going to... Listen, come on in just as you are. But when you come in, there is a standard. Let me put it this way. When you come in just as you are, there is a biblical standard that you have to come up to. You don't bring the values low to the ground with you. we all hanging out. Everybody has a pass. Everybody. Listen. Jesus knows that everybody has a past. That's why he came. He did not come after you met him and use his blood and his spirit on you to take him back to the vomit. That's an insult. And I'm talking to leaders too. These are leadership circles right here. The Council of Jerusalem. Listen. That's why Swindoll said it again. Devoted men. Not devoted disciples. Those are devoted, courageous, spirit-filled leaders. 
<laughs> that are hammering. You know what hammering means? They barge themselves. We're not going to get off this meeting until we hear from God. I'm not going to play with this because the bride is in danger. It's almost like a scientist said, I don't care. I'm not going to go home. I'm going to stay in the lab until I find the antivirus to kill this virus that's killing the whole world. Devoted leaders, courageous leaders, men and women filled with the Holy Spirit who's hammering out of the is emotionally charged sometimes the, the devil will even let the emotion the cultural the ethnic or the racial issue be so charged up if you're not devoted to christ you give in to the culture you give in to the ethnicity you give in to the elitism you give in to the money you give in to the skirts you give in to the connection you give in to the denomination and you begin to act like them like worst dictators of the yesteryears. We need men and women who are devoted to Jesus Christ, to the affairs of Christ and his gospel. Look at the text. It says this. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church. This is not putting flags and confetti, throwing fireworks. No. Look at the, the how were they were welcomed by the text. Watch the watch the text here. They were welcomed by the church and the apostle and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done <laughs> through them. Can, can I tell you what's going on here? Paul and Barabbas got back to Jerusalem. They get so excited. They begin to tell the leaders and the elders, Men, the church in Antioch now has a second floor. The church of Antioch has a backyard where we can play basketball. The church of Antioch has a, a swimming pool where all the children are can swim. The church of Antioch has a lawn that is so green. Even in the winter time, you can see flowers coming. The church of Antioch have lights now. You can have lights while the pastor is doing jumpy jacks and everybody is in the presence. Is that what they're reporting? No. Let me submit to you. In the middle of spiritual, spirit-filled, courageous leaders, you don't come with cotton candy to make them excited to forget how to make rational, God-giving decisions. That's what's going on here. Paul and Barnabas begin to give them the report of what they see. How Gentiles are turning from idols and accepting Christ and being baptized and become elders. On the return from the short term trip, they are appointing them as elders. How Christians are becoming, listen, solid prayer warriors. How in Lystra, they beat him up to death. He could have died and they thought he was dying. But those new Convert disciples, join their hands together, they circle him and pray. And then he got his strength, he got his life, he got his health back to get up the next day. When the leaders of Jerusalem began to hear those, you know what those kind of report does to the leaders? He recharged them. Now this is not just promises anymore. We are hearing evidence of the faith. By the way, when... The senior pastor of this church here in Hawaii, he was showing a demonstration recently. In fact, my dear brother from Chuck Swindoll's church this week just introduced me to that great teaching. Listen, dead leaders running. You can Google it for yourself. Dead leaders running. And he's showing you in one of his illustrations where you can have somebody, the moment you meet them, they just fueling you with encouragement. And you feel as if you are airborne now, like an airplane. But you can encounter some other person. It's like an, a big flat tire in your tire. Shh, air is going out. Energy is leaving you. Frustration is golfing your chest. Discouragement wants you to quit the ministry. Why? Because they're looking at lawns, lights. 
bling blings. They can care less about the Gentiles that are coming to the faith of Christ Jesus. That's not what they see. Because you need eyes of faith to see people who are hungry for the gospel. Teenagers who can live their lifestyles to become, listen, young Timothy in the church. You need mind of Christ to see this young girl with spiritual potential. You need to have the spirit of God in your soul to see this young man means business with God. This is not a joker or prayer. So let me encourage you. The leaders in Jerusalem began to get refueled by those two guys. Even though those two guys, Paul and Barnabas, is coming to look up to them for ecclesiastical direction. Look at the text for yourself. It says that when they saw them, they were glad, they were happy, and they received them. with. They welcomed them. And here's the second issue. Verse 5. Acts 15 verse 5. I show you the first issue presented in verse 1. The second issue is now within the ranks of the Pharisees in the church. Men who know the law inside out. The Pharisees, they were not stupid bunch. Those were the brains who can flip every word in the law of Moses and tell you what it means. Those were the teachers of the, of the time. They know it so well, they become so hypocritical with it. At some point, they can forget God and give you all the Greek and the Hebrews. When they see the Pharisees, it's not just because these guys hate God or His word. They know it so well, they can give, leave God to the side and start running with their laws. <laughs> Verse 5. Then some of the believers, don't miss that. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and they are required to obey the law of Moses. You get that? So trouble is stirring up in Antioch. Now you got among you some of the brothers who are Pharisees who are telling the other people, the Gentiles, you must be circumcised and you must obey everything in the law of... You know what they were doing in the house, in the church, in the ministry, in the family? is pushing their agendas. They were pushing their agendas against the, by faith, by grace through faith, purity of the gospel. So when you have those undercover in your midst... And you want to compromise to let them do what they want to do. That's how you can turn a church into a synagogue of Satan. And by the time Jesus comes to inspect, he says, man, I know your deeds. I know you love the word. But you have left the teaching of the Nicolaites take over. You have left the teaching of the heavy packages take over. You have to let uh, the teaching of the favoritism take over. The teaching of the racism take over. The teaching of black gospel, of Hispanic gospel, of Haitian gospel, or of blah, blah, take over. And you override the pure gospel of Jesus. Look how they're going to respond. This is where faith began to prepare herself to take the stand. And silence. This is where grace is about to rise up from the other side. To say, uh-uh. You come through this thing by grace through faith. That's why I said, I wonder when Paul is listening to that. The theology, the Pauline fibers are dropping up. Taking their position in his soul by the Holy Spirit. So when he can go back now, listen to me. To a third hub of church in the woman's world, the church of Ephesus. He can go back now to write to the church of Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It is by grace through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift from God. You got it. You cannot give what you don't have. And you can only give what you have. You have a false gospel, false gospel you will have. You've been compromising all your life. It's time that you repent and get the true deal. Drop the trash. And all those you've been misleading, tell them, confess your soul. It's okay to confess 
You will be free and they will be free too. Look at the text for yourself. And it stood up. It says in verse 6, The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. What question? Number 5 and verse 1. Verse 5, verse these are the two questions. Inside, notice what Luke is doing. Luke did not tell us the council started to handle the situation when Paul and Barnabas arrived alone. No. Luke began to tell us the council began to handle the situation when Paul and Barnabas arrived, but when the inner secret agents began to pull their agenda up, then the council big up under the wisdom of the Holy Spirit of God to watch me. Krino. This is where I've come up with this Greek term, and it's true. Judgment, decisiveness of devoted spirit-filled leaders. These are not arrogant people. These are men who are guardian of the faith. They can be of any age, but they simply need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They need to be all in it for Jesus. They cannot be in it for Jesus and the organization. Because sometimes they can ask you for your tax rights back. If they do, would you continue to preach the gospel? If they fire you, would you quit and go for another job? Or would you keep on preaching the unadulterated gospel? Persecution is coming in America. Where you will not be able to stand against certain sin. Who would you choose? What side would you be on? This is as relevant as you can have it as a sermon, as a series. Whose identity would you be ready to flip the gospel to so you can survive or so you can continue with the administration and Jesus has been kept out. The truth has been kept. The gospel is nowhere to be found. I wish I could tell you how many churches have left the gospel behind a long time ago? Horrible shutter. This is, uh, by the way, when I'm talking about a book from my pulpit, I don't get any commissions for them. I just thank God that we can be a mouthpiece. This brother here by the name of Jared C. Wilson. Gospel wakefulness. Man, this guy has made a dent in the evangelical church in asking us to stick with the gospel watch out and keep your eyes on the true gospel able to train your spirit to even detect the spirits of the last days which is not about the work of christ if the missionary movement of the church need to keep on moving purely as church jesus christ is returning for we better we better Take an evaluation to see what in the world are we teaching from the sacred desk. Is it the gospel or Walmart strategy? Is it target expansion strategy? Or are we truly after soul with what can change them and has the power to change them? The gospel alone. For Paul will say, I'm not afraid of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto what? salvation. Your mother cannot give it to you. Your daddy cannot give it to you. Your organization cannot give it to you. But the Lord Jesus Christ is giving it out there freely like free bread. Get your fill. Get your, get your stomach filled. Charge yourself. Receive again. The gospel is free. Get it. Get it. It's by grace through faith. Look at the text. It says that when they begin to discuss the issue, Verse 6, the apostle and rulers met together to hammer out this emotionally charged issue after much discussion. You see the word much? Circle that. This is why it's not a little joke. They just crack among themselves and they get up to give the, the final decision. This is where grace is about to stand up to speak out. After much discussion, Peter got up. Everybody says this with me. Peter got up. There is a moment you cannot stay on the bench. You got to get up and speak. Peter got up like he did on the day of Pentecost. This is where Peter is getting up with the staff in his hand. Listen, look as a physician. I can see the old man trying to get up from his wheelchair and trying to pull up his old bones to try to straighten himself out to stand up. Oh, Peter got up. 
So before he can even say a word, listen, let's take a look with me. John W. start with the NCL, take them there. Let, let, let's take a look with me. Even to get the strength to stand up, it requires a lot of energy. So he finally got himself up. He took a little silence first. He got on his breath. Peter got up. And when he got up, he had, he addressed them. L listen to the words. Brothers, you need to hear what I'm about to tell you. It's heavy. You take Peter, you take James, you take John. Whenever those guys are about to make some heavy duty decision or drop some heavy duty biblical non-negotiable, they always preceded it with the words, brothers, you read the book of James. In fact, the word brothers in James, those are the three inner circle disciples with the Lord. One of them is going to take stand right there, Peter. That's the preacher of Pentecost. The other one is going to be James, the senior pastor of the church of Jerusalem in this group. <laughs> I wonder what was John, the youngest one, still standing around watching how are the older, elder, respected brothers will speak in the face of serious opposition against not an institution but against the movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter stood up. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit help me. Help me to stand. There is no time to back off or to run for safety. Help me to stand. Peter got up and address brothers you know that some times ago god made a choice among you that the gentiles might hear faith comes by hearing i'm telling you paul's theology is shaping up that the gentiles might hear from my lips I, I wish I was there to see Peter trying to lift up his trembling old arms to say the same lips that denied him three times. <laughs> By my lips, God spoke the message of the gospel and they believed. I did not speak by just blowing hard I was not out there to impress anybody. In fact, my Galilean accent give me up every time. Even a slave girl can we love. I have a thick accent from Galilee. But when the Holy Spirit filled me up on the day of Pentecost, these lips did not get stuck with accent. They preach the message of the gospel which has the power to save. And it's come out of my lips. It's not for me. It's come from the source who sent it out through my feeble lips. If I stuck to my lips, I can tell you these lips can only deny Christ. But the power that I've been identified with on the day of Pentecost made his lips a witness to make disciples. Peter said, my lips let it out. Watch the text. My lips let it out. This is not lips denying anymore. Don't keep on using your ex, your past as a cover up to do what's wrong even in the church. If your lips have been converted, let it be converted all the way. If your mind have been changed, let it be changed all the way. If your feet have been changed, let it be walking with the faith. Walk with righteousness. Walk with the Lord. Let your body, we read it earlier from the book of Romans, be a sacrifice that is offered unto the Lord. Now, look, watch this. Let them become anointing to tell people, I don't care about the anointing. I'm going to tell you who Jesus Christ is. Let your lips, let your hands, may I say it? Let your hair become a billboard to attract people to the gospel of Christ. We're not talking about legalism here. 
We're talking about I'm all in because I'm a sacrifice on the altar for Jesus Christ. Peter said, look at the text. I don't want to look like the world when I'm in the sense, among the saints, and I am a saint. Why will I be going back out there to cause people to misunderstand my life, my destiny, my character, my values? Why? Why will I be standing up my neck with all of those nonsense to make people look at me down and destroy my self-esteem? Why will I go among people who are already racist and set myself up for them to express their racism and destroy my soul for me? I cannot be paying big money and giving people my soul to destroy for me and make me inferior and act inferior and remain. I'm getting big, but I'm becoming a baby inside because my inside is being destroyed. See now! Disrespectful. Be quiet. Sit down. Be quiet. Oh, not you. <laughs> they laugh at you. They just, they're trying to destroy your self esteem. And you come out of there, you got a piece of paper, but you don't even know your name. You don't even know who you are. You cannot make the rightful decision anymore, but you got money. You got paper. You got title. You got position. We call it systematic, systemic. Racism. How do you detect that by the power of the Holy Spirit? And to condition your child, to condition your partner, to condition your friends, to condition the church, to see through that and don't expose yourself to be taken advantage of. Eh? When you hear those truths, this is not people getting on your nerves. This is people who really care for your future. And when you get there, you are supposed to be leaving the office. You are the one picking up the trash now. You are the one sweeping the floor. And then you're going to hate the person who was trying to supervise you, guide you, fund your life. Come on! Go back to the text. There is, you left, you, you're meddling now. Look, look at the text. It, it says in the gospel here, verse 8, God who knows the heart show that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. You know what that means? This is where I get the statement I make all the time. The Holy Spirit of God doesn't have a copy of himself that is inferior for the people from Africa, lower for people in Haiti, down the street for people from Jamaica. No! It's the same Holy Spirit it is an insult to the gospel when you hear any racist mind look at any ethnic group, self individual, to treat them as if they are the next witch doctor because they were not born in America. Because they have a Galilean accent and they are willing to look at them as if, yeah, I'm not sure if you're really saved. I'm not sure if you're even practicing something in your pocket. I'm not sure you might be having the gospel here or something else. It's an insult to the Holy Spirit of God when these kind of things are still alive and well in mission field, in conference room, in boardroom of major organization. We cannot take the gospel to the world and treating save people in such a manner. Hear me well. If they are mixing the gospel with voodoo, stop. Confront them. That's what Paul and Barnabas doing there. It's not voodoo. They're, they're mixing the gospel with Jewish practices. Circumcision, the way of Moses. This, the same way they handle this, if they're still sleeping with someone that's not their spouses, their breast is all over the world. And they're coming next second and covering up the arm at the shoulder. Tell them, cover the other breasts. You cannot be on the streets like that with no decency. And then you come in, and you, you, you're showing up among people who are devoting themselves to the Lord and what we call elders. The uh, minister, but listen to me. We're not popping legalism, but we're popping the truth, and the gospel transforms lives. He takes ex terrorist Paul and makes him an agent in the church, a leader in the church. Same Holy Spirit, and Peter is testifying. This is Peter speaking still. 
to the leaders, to the council. Watch this. He's not over yet. Verse 10. Now then, why do you try to test God? What's that? I'm sorry? Verse 9. He made no distinction between us and them. You see us and them? This is what's ruling in the church now. You have us and them. You can go to a multi-ethnic, multi-racial church. You can still see the us and them game being played. I wish you could have sit in a staff meeting. I wish you would have get into a car. I wish you would have get into tap into some private cell phone conversation to hear the jokes between the us and the them and the Holy Spirit who's everywhere is listening to all of these things and watching the same people playing the game when they pop up now public on the stage or before the camera they're like whoa they want the holy spirit now to fill them up and then to talk to those multi-ethnic multi-racial people as if they are on the same level the holy spirit of god said man you playing you playing who are you playing with them or me what in the world is happening Verse 9b, look at the text. It says this, O oh Lord, for the purified, for he purified their hearts, here is our daughter, by faith. You see how the faith of a person is purified, a heart of a person is purified? It's not by Greek and Hebrew. It's the, faith, the pure faith of the gospel that purifies the heart. Circle that in your Bible. It is the faith. It's not that my, listen, it's not my dead daddy. My dead daddy cannot purify my heart for me. My heart cannot be pure by theology. Because you can have a, someone who's so theologically savvy and a fill of a filthy heart rest his heart, ethnocentric loaded heart. They're laughing with you, they're cutting your chest underneath. They're smiling, embracing you, and they're sabotaging your character with someone else. Peter said, listen to the text, he made no distinction, who is he? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit made no distinction between them and us, between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. That's the first leg of the balance. Baby, what do they call the balance in the courtroom again? There's a technical term for that balance in the courtroom. When the judges have to make the, the what's the what's the term for that again? There's a term. There's a term for that balance on the logo. The judges balance before they eat touch the gavel. Bev, can you hear me? What's the term for that gavel? That gavel, that icon. What's the term for that? Scales. Scales. That's it. Thank you, honey. That's it. It says that faith is one side of the scale. And grace will be the other side of the scale. But it says that faith does the purifying of the heart first. You see what Peter is saying here? He purified their hearts by faith. Verse 10. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the neck. Do you see Peter's words? <laughs> Peter's not playing here. He says, you're putting on the neck a burden that even our Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of them, watch the text. Why are you putting on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? You know what I thought about this? Why are you trying to enslave Christians like we were enslaved coming out of Africa? There are a lot of slaves going on in the churches. Listen to me. There are a lot of slavery going on in our churches. I'm talking about the evangelical churches lately. They're carrying burdens that's beyond their normal mind can handle. They're, using Peter's word, their neck have yokes that are burdensome out of legalism, out of cultural trash, loaded up, not with the gospel. Uh, 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 verse 11, no, 
This is an emphatic New Testament no. This one stands by itself. Peter said no. Hapax Logamana, I too stand. And I said, no, stop the burdens loading. It says in the text, no, we believe it is through grace. Here is the other scales weight. It's by faith. It is by grace. No wonder later on Paul will tap into this. By this time, Paul is already injected. It's faith and grace. Grace and faith. And later on, Paul make it the cardinal statement in Ephesians. By the time he reached the third Hubble church. By grace through faith. Not of yourself. It is through grace of our Lord Jesus. That we are what? Saved just as they are. This means the foot of the cross is flat. Jews, same flatness at the cross. Gentiles, same flatness at the cross. American, come on in. A Canadian, Mexican, Guatemalan, what else? Chilean. The foot of the cross is flat. No other ways. But by grace, through faith in our Lord Jesus. Buddha, no way. Muhammad, no. This is it right here. You're not being arrogant if you keep Muhammad out. You're not being arrogant if you keep Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out. <laughs> you cannot include Buddha in the choir. Just like you cannot put the witch doctor in the choir. There is no room for Muhammad in the choir and hope that Muhammad is a missionary alongside the missionaries to go and preach. What gospel? What kind of gospel? Please make the good judgments when it comes to leadership. Muhammad is welcome. Buddha is welcome so that they can find Jesus Christ. This young man who just died maybe three years ago, he wrote the book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. He used to be around with Ravi Zacharias sometimes back. He died with a terrible cancer. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. They can be seeking whatever. Let them come in. But use whatever they're using as an outreach attraction. Don't let them sit in there too long. Give them Jesus. Otherwise, they're going to become a virus in the mix. They begin to do their own mission trip feel and activities in your midst. God will be alert. And the Holy Spirit of God will make sure he warns you to know when they're in the midst so that the Pharisees can become true believers in Jesus. Peter said, just like we are. Then the whole assembly became what, church? This is where I said, grace and faith silence the court. You know what assembly now we're talking about? Look what you to know. The team from Antioch is silenced because now they got it. The team within the ranks, the Pharisees, everybody quiet. Why? Grace stood up. Faith has spoken. Jesus is on the throne. Faith stood up. Grace has spoken and Jesus is on the throne. Everybody quiet. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about now the miraculous sign and wonders that God has done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James now spoke up. This is the senior pastor of Jerusalem. After Paul and Barnabas gave the testimony, after Peter came out and settled the deliberation. You can listen to me. Peter just set the deliberation in the court. And grace stood up. Faith stood up. Silence. And James said, now I can talk. I got something to say. Paul, you through? Barnabas, you through? Guys, let's clap. The Holy Spirit of God signed wonders and miracles just like he had promised. These guys saw it on the mission field. Now James stood up and spoke. Listen to me. Even when James stood up to speak, I want you to see the respect. He's going to give precedence to what Peter said. 
And let me see what I'm saying here. When you're doing serious theological research or writing, you always make reference to some other intelligence or respectable character in the field ahead of you. That's why you do research. You don't just pop out with some new things and you start dancing everywhere as if your work now is substantiated by nobody. And then you're out there like an authority. No, he, you are in any serious field, whether in the medical field, theological field, engineering field, you always appeal to an authority in the field that have gone before you. Watch, 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 watch James. He stand to speak, first word out of his mouth. Brothers, same thing. I told you that strategy already. Brothers, listen to me. <laughs> I love to say this word when I'm preaching. Listen, listen to me. Simon, he's appealing to author. Simon is in the midst. Simon, respect for the <laughs> respect for leadership. Can I say that to you? Respect for his position. Respect for his authority. Uh, appealing to even though he's an apostle too he's appealing to apostolic authority to make his statement you don't know when you do that you're not just speaking on your own or by yourself it's almost as if the president of the united states of america is about to speak but behind him he has this congressman that congress as why will he have to no he's saying i got power more than my office with me <laughs> uh, sometimes they just want to just take off and then before you know nobody knows who they are they've been to no one's school they've been trained nowhere they've not even been in the Sunday school class they don't even know where John 316 is they want to take off <laughs> I'm saying who's teaching our church now the importance of respect for elders for parents for teachers for principal this is not just in church this is everywhere. It begins in the home. They begin to disrespect in their parents, their mom, their dad, their older brother, their older sister in the home. Don't expect them to have respect for the police on the streets, for the teachers in the classroom, for the principal on the campus, for the law of the land. They can get to the White House. They begin to, trick, to, to take home with them. Listen to me. Classified information. Why? Because they have no respect for the office, no respect for the Supreme Court, no respect for the law of the land. They swear before the Constitution, no respect for the Constitution of the country. Why? Because they fell that even way back at home. Everywhere they go, arrogance took the, took the lead. Money, when I, they cannot get to be arrogant, manipulation is playing until you want to raise its ugly head. James said, brothers, he addressed everyone as equal. But now he pointed out among everyone, Simon has described to us Watch this. He passed by the human realm now. He goes higher. How God, <laughs> this thing has nothing to do with Simon. It was God who's been tested when they put the yokes on the Gentiles. It was God's salvation who's been polluted. It has nothing to do with the church. The glory belongs to God. It's to the praise of his glory. When you let them do whatever they do, you are testing the glory of God. You join with them in polluting the favor of God, the glory of God, the majestic awesomeness of our God. This is no joke of our responsibility. It's the God who made the heaven and the earth and kept everybody alive by breathing, who has this responsibility. That when you let this down to the floor, you're not testing the senior pastor, the bishop, the institution, the organization, the denomination. You, no, you're dealing with God's character. Watch this. James went up past Peter. When Peter described us how God, at first, that's where he belonged. <laughs> Listen, uh, God is the head of my life, but is he the first in your decision-making process? Is God the first in your home? When you have to make a business transaction, 
You have to write a number. You have to write a tax report. Is God first? I'm talking about just like what we're talking about here. This is an ecclesiastical, doctrinal, leadership, missiological sequence. God, at first, show his concern by taking from the Gentile a people for him. So, you know what that tells me? Ecclesiastically, missiologically, evangelistically, every time someone comes to Christ, it's God who takes them out of the Haiti for himself, out of the Jamaica for himself. It's God who's proking them. You know what that goes? This goes right with the matter of our church. Building unto our God a kingdom of priests from every nation, every tribe. It is God. Nobody can call them to God unless God take one for himself. And so we make ourselves available as gloves in God's hands. God, who do you want to take from Walmart today? Who do you have in the hospital floor today? Is there somebody in the law school today? Is there someone on campus today? Is there someone on my streets in the dry cleaner in the wall? Is the God, who do you want? Who do you want to take? Use my life to take them into yourself. It is God who find them to be your people. That he wants to take for himself. S15. Words of the prophets. James still speaking. Are in agreement. With this. What is this? The decision that they just made. The word of the prophets before them. Are in agreement with God. Has been doing all along. And thus. James said this. Write this down. We're going to use this to distribute to the known world, Jews and Gentiles. These are the requirements. They don't have Gentiles. As I stated earlier, the issue is not whether the Gentiles can be converted. They can. It's not that they can receive the Holy Spirit. They can. Peter testified to all that already. It's the issue of, by grace, through faith, but also circumcision. <laughs> but also uh, the law of Moses. Watch this. He is the first New Testament coalition writings of apostolic authority. Right there. Not Paul. This is the combination of all the apostolic authority, the council. After the deliberation, grace has spoken, silence everybody, they pull their pen now. After this, I will return and rebuild. David's fallen tents, its wounds I will rebuild, I will restore it, that the remnant of, my, uh, of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, even back then. You know what he's quoting here? That's a 9-11 promise. That's what? A 9-11 promise. This is a promise made by Amos long time ago in Amos 9-11 that even the Gentiles too will come to know the Savior of the world. God had the Gentiles in mind long time ago. And he says there that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles will bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, who does these things? The Lord that have been known for how long, church? Ages. In other words, eternal have established it from all eternity past that the Gentiles too will come in. Let me put it this way. The one who is eternal knew back then that the Gentiles will bear his authority. Anytime in the biblical record you find the word name, you can substitute it for authority. The eternal one said that long time ago, he had in his mind that the Haitian too, the American too, the Guatemalan too, the Panamanian too, the Madagascan too, will bear his authority. After they print these things down, here is the first postcard letter. It is the distribution of this thing that's going to make Paul discover Timothy back in Lystra. Watch this. That's 19 and I'm just going to cruise through it. It is my judgment. Somebody's in front of the place. It is in my judgment. Therefore, 
And we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them, telling them to abstain from. I want you to notice with me the thing that they said now for the whole wide world. Jews and Gentiles, but primarily the Gentiles. To break that yoke, here are the requirements. Watch this. Instead, number one, tell them, abstain from food polluted by idols. Do you know what that goes back to? Almost at the first of the Ten Commandments. You stay away from food sacrificed to idols. Number two, stay away from sexual immorality. Listen to me. These are the big spirits that's going to be everywhere you see Paul give the church a list of no, no. You will find these in there. Paul, not only was a great learner, but was a great teacher and a great preserver of the truth. Do you get me? Everywhere Paul is writing some warning for the church, he set those things in there. You look at, search it for yourself. Number two, sexual immorality. This one is a demon. When it gets your airplane down, there is no parachute that can catch you. Let me put it in the current day vernacular. When you get into a little panties that's not yours, you're going to lose your mind. When you begin to let your breasts shake up all over town, and then you are, I don't care if you are in a five-star hotel, nobody sees you. That's what you think. Paul did not, James did not, the council did not put this here together because they wanted to, we are part of this, the ULM council, we write policies, we are the guys who were the policy makers for the church. Uh, look at the text. Sexual immorality, stay away from there. Number three, stay from meat that have been strangled in animals. Number four, don't eat blood. And then he wrap it up by doing the same thing. Appeal to higher authority again. Watch this. For Moses has been preached in every city. This is not saying Moses isn't behind microphone. This is not saying Moses is on platform in every synagogue. That's not what that's saying. This Moses here is not the man. This is referring to the five first books of the Bible called the Torah. In theological circle, Hebraic circle, they used to call them Moses. Moses is not the Moses, the man on two feet. When they say Moses has been preached in every city, that is to say the first five books inspired of the Bible. Genesis to Deuteronomy have been preached in where? Every, every city. He did not stop. Listen to this again. And then he says, Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is, listen to this, read in every synagogue on every what? Sabbath. Isn't that what Paul has been using as a major strategy during his mission trips? Every one of them. Every city he lands, he tried to find a synagogue. You know why? Because there's Moses being read in there. Moses is not just word from the Torah. Listen to me. It is inspired word <laughs> which connect the mind, even the blind mind, to the word that is inspired, make their hearts and their highways ready for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When grace and faith silenced the womb, silenced the court, they did not silence it for them to go out arrogant. They were going out for more Gentiles to come to know Christ as their personal Savior. They, did not out, they were not out there collecting slaves to salute them, to serve them. No, they were out there to deliberate women to deliberate children, to deliberate slaves, to deliberate Gentiles, even to deliberate Jews from the law of Moses that even their fathers could not bear. What are we out there doing lately? Are we out there trying to make slaves with our titles, with our names, with our campuses, with our books, with our family? Or out out there to defend the gospel of the Lord Jesus? Are you finding a terrorist to go and sabotage the name of Jesus from your home? Is your home a sanctuary preparing terrorists to go and mar the reputation of Christ? Or are you raising 
men and women, boys and girls, church leaders who will honor the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ no matter where they go, what they do, whether they eat or drink, suffer or fine. Are you raising boys and girls? I saw a group this morning out of an island where children barely can eat properly, barely can eat a full uh, complete meal. When I watched them this morning quoting the Holy Scriptures, I said, I remember that. I remember this very man who's leading these kids used to be himself. At the age of 10, he made it public last week, leading Sunday school classes, trying to tell kids to love Jesus. What kind of kids are we raising? Kids who have Bible but hate Jesus? Hmm? Kids who are dishonoring the day of the Lord? What kind of children do we want to raise? When we are old and gray, do we want to have leaders who will lead us to compromise? Or we want to raise leaders who will say, Daddy, Mommy, Auntie, you helped me when I was young. Therefore, let me help you with what you helped me. May I submit to you? There are some who are still struggling and fighting to raise boys and girls, men and women, who are authentic with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus today, this is not just a message for leaders or for guarding the truth or guarding the church or talking about just historical event of the it's a responsibility for all you have been held responsible simply for what you heard today you heard plain truth from the lord what would you do with that if you don't know him as your personal savior you've been hurt by church you've been hurt by an institution by a person today the same holy spirit that purifies hearts can purify your heart I don't care how worth your past has been. Even in the church, the Holy Spirit is still available to purify your heart. Grace is still calling you as she stands to silence every stronghold in your life. Listen to me. Grace can put to mute every button that's shouting loud from your grandmama, your grandmama, your great 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 grand family stronghold. Grace can destroy all of them. And she has her arms open together with faith. Say, why don't you come to Jesus? That's what Peter declared to the council. The deliberation is that we have grace. We have faith. You can come to Christ on your own. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. It's not my loudness. It's not my outline, the structure of a sermon. It is the power of God. Through his living word, inspired word, that is transforming our lives. Unsaved become saved when they hear the clear gospel. What is the clear gospel? Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead to give eternal life to everyone who believes him. That's the gospel. The same word is made efficacious to strengthen the soul of saints who want to live for Jesus Christ, whether publicly or privately. So we call to you today, and give our lives, and give our home, give our spouses, our children, and give your church to you, you who are a keeper, a transformer, and a sustainer. Bless your people indeed. In the name of Jesus, amen. And everybody says, amen. The Lord's be with you. Have a blessed Sunday afternoon.